the term goal is such a important and difficult to explain concept, right? And, and because what you want is a way is like, um, I think only conscious beings can have conscious goals. <laughs> Uh, everything else is doing selection, and but selection does invent goals. And in a way that um, the the way that biology reinterprets the past in the present is kind of how helps you to understand there was a goal in the past. Now, right? It's kind of like goals only exist back in time. So, first of all, uh, only conscious beings can have conscious goals i'm not even going to touch that one <laughs> why why, um, why? well I, go for it come on what were the line between conscious goals and uh non-conscious goals exactly All right and also maybe just okay. on top of that you said a touring test for goal-directed behavior what's 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 it what's the tour what, what does a touring test potentially look like so if you got two objects we were thinking about this so we were we, we actually got some funding to work together on two teams so I'm trying to do, and part of this is I'm trying to do a bit of theory, and Sarah's teaching me a bit of theory, and Sarah's trying to design experiments, and I'm teaching experiments, because I think it's really good for us to have that. So say, um, when would a... So that's good. I like this... This I mean, Should we use the Dan Dennett essay? That he wrote on, yeah, on, on, and I can explain why we wouldn't want to call it a Turing test after, but... Yeah, yeah. But, so Dan Dennett wrote this really nice essay about... Um, uh, herding cats and free will inflation. <laughs> the title is so brilliant. I think that's the actual title. That's I think the so. Title, yeah. Yeah. Herding cats and free will inflation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. something like that. I mean, it's not, maybe not. It. And so. No, I think that's right. So if you've got a, let's imagine you've got two objects on a hillside. Okay. And it just happens to be a snowy hill. And let's just say you see an object go rolling down the hill. Or you, 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 you and the rock oh, rolls down the hill, but the start goes to the end. How do you know that objects had a goal? Now you unveil the object and you'll see it's actually a skier. And the skier starts at the top and goes down the bottom. Great. Then you look at the rock. Rock rolls down the hill, gets to the bottom. How can you tell the difference between the two? So, and what Dan says is like, well, this, it's clear the skier's in control and the, um, because they're, adju they're adjusting the trajectory. So there's some updating going on. Then the only way you could really do that is you have to put the skier back to the top of the hill again. They would tend to start roughly in the same space and probably go to, take all that, that complex set of trajectories and end up pretty much at the same finish point, right? With pl plus or minus a few meters. Whereas if it was just a random rock going down tra random trajectory, that wouldn't happen. And so what Sarah and I were kind of doing when we were writing this grant, we were like, we need to somehow instantiate the skier and the rock in mm -hmm. an experiment and then say, okay, when does the object, when it, so for an object to have a goal, it has to have an update, it has to have some sensing and some kind of, you know, inbuilt actuation to respond to the environment. And, and then we just have to iterate on that. And maybe Sarah, you can then fill in the Turing test part. Well, yeah, I guess the motivation for me was slightly different. So I, I get really frustrated about conversations about consciousness, as most people do. Um, you know, and a lot of people are, are, which is not necessarily related to to free will directly or to this goal-directed behavior, but I think there's a whole set of bundled and related topics here. But I think for me, I was, you know, everybody's always interested in explaining intrinsic experience and quantifying intrinsic experience. And there's all sorts of problems with that. Um, because you can never actually be another physical system, so you can't know what it's like to be another physical system. Um, so I always thought there must be some way of getting at this problem about if an agent or an entity is conscious or at least has internal representations, and those are real physical things, that there it must have causal consequences. So the way I would ask the question of consciousness is not, you know, what it, is it like intrinsically, but if if things have intrinsic experience, is there any observable difference from the outside about the the kind of causation that that physical system would enact in? And for me, the most interesting thing that humans do is have imagination. So like we can imagine rockets centuries before we build them. They've become real physical things because we imagine them. And people might disentangle that from conscious experience, but I think a lot of the sort of imagination we do is actually a conscious process. So then this becomes a question of if I were observing systems and I said, one had an internal representation, which is slightly different than a conscious experience, obviously. So I'm entangling some concepts, but it's a loose set of thought experiments. Then how and I and I set them up in a physically equivalent situation. Um, would it be the case that there would be 
experimental observables associated with it. And that that became the idea of trying to actually measure for internal representation of consciousness. So Turing basically didn't want to do that. You just wanted the machine that could emulate and trick you into having the behavior, but never dealt with the internal experience because he didn't know how to do that. And I guess I was wondering, is there a way to set up the experiment where you could actually test for that? For imagination that yeah. led to the That there was thing. something internal going on, some kind of inner world, as people say, but I, I, or you could say, you know, like, it, it actually is an agent. It's making decisions. It, it has an internal representation. And whether you say that's experience or not is a different thing, but at least the, the feature that there's some abstraction it's doing that's not obvious from looking at the physical substrates. Do, do you think it's possible to do that kind of thing? One of the compelling things about the Turing test is that you know defining intelligence, defining any complicated concept as, um, as a thing like observing it from the surface, and not caring about what's going on deep inside, because how do you know? That's the point. So the idea is exactly that. So what we're trying to do, the Turing test for goal-directedness, is literally um, take some objects that clearly don't have any internal representation, grains of sand blowing on the beach or something, right? And, I don't know, a crab wandering around on the beach, and then generating an experiment where we literally, the experiment generates an entity that literally has no internal representation to sand, like a drop, these are oil droplets actually, what we've got in mind, a robot that makes oil droplets. But then what we want to try and do is train the oil droplets to be like crabs, <laughs> give them an internal representation, yeah. give them the ability to um, integrate information from the environment so they, under, they remember the past, um, are in the present, and can imagine a future. And at a very limited way, their kind of game engine, their limited simulation of the world allows them to then make a decision. They're objects across time. 